Before I ask our first speaker to, to share his views, I'm going to try and set a little bit of the context here. Um, we have about 15% schools in the private sector in this country, which together account for some 40% of enrollments. Um, we have several challenges in terms of uh, looking at private education or moving towards a state where even public-private partnership from educational activities does not arise. So profits, uh, reasonable surplus may be generated by us by an educational institution, but it must then be plowed back into furtherance of the same cause. And that really is the crux of the problem, because that judgment in one stroke makes it impossible for any educational institution to declare that it is, it, that it is uh, making any kind of profit. So profit, by, in a sense, has become a bad word. We have the issue of ideology-based policies, which Professor Geeta uh, Gandhi Kingdon went through uh, in, in some detail in the morning, rather than evidence-based. And we have strong teacher unions in the government space, which are uh, extremely resistant to the idea of having somebody from the outside come in to run uh, a government institution. If you think about public-private partnerships, you need to recall how the whole concept started. And the concept began in the West <clears throat> during the economic crisis of, I think, the early 80s, when government started looking at how they could replace their own, uh, uh, their own need to spend money on providing infrastructure services with a, an alternate source of funding. And that's when they looked at bringing in the private sector to, who would provide both management expertise as well as the resources required. But underlying this entire discussion was a very important fact which, unfortunately, in, in, in the case of education in India, we're not able to take into account, which is that the deployment of capital by the private partner was entitled to a certain defined reasonable rate of return. It is that rate of return or profit on capital employed which is the question here. So I'm with that context, I think, let me start by inviting uh, Mr. Anand Sudarshan to begin. Uh, I'm not very familiar with the K-12 space, the school space, um, besides the fact that uh, I went to school, <laughs> and besides the fact that I have a son who studies in a school, he's 14 years old, and besides the fact that my wife teaches in a school, and she's a special educator. So besides that, uh, I don't have much of a, an exposure to schools. Uh, but what I do know uh, is uh, if there is one area in, in uh, education that is truly exciting and it's got the uh, power to fundamentally alter the dynamics of the country um, and as much as I am in higher education I'll say this uh, it is schools education um, what I will do today is to share with you two experiences that uh, we have had in working together with the government one in India and one outside India uh, these are the two experiences we have had and uh, I will share the experiences first and draw three or four inferences from that. These are not conclusions, largely because uh, they just simply do not have the statistical validity for us to use the word conclusion, but they are certainly inferences and certainly experiential inferences that we can draw, which may be of uh, some use uh, in similar kind of contexts. I'm, sh I'm absolutely sh sure that the same kind of a context is probably not likely to happen, but in similar contexts it could be of use. Um, PPP for long and, and I uh, am in the education sector, higher education sector, since the last little over five and a half years. Prior to that, PPP for me meant problem, problem, problem. <laughs> you know, and uh, how do you therefore move it from, you know, problem, 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 to possibilities, possibilities and possibilities. And then truly, if possibilities are not good enough, you have to increase the probabilities, and probabilities and probabilities of execution. How do you actually do that? When I came on board uh, at Manipal Education, I came with about 15 years of prior experience in the uh, technology space. Besides the, the hype and hoopla that uh, technology space has garnered, uh, the technology space in India and working out of India uh, globally had one interesting characteristic, which is we almost you know, had nothing to do with the government. We had no idea you know, engaging with the government what it really meant. 
So when I came on board and first had a look at uh, Sikkim Manipal University, which is a member of the group uh, under the uh, Sikkim Manipal University Trust, member of the overall Manipal Education uh, and Medical Group, and I first saw it, and it was intriguing to me because that was a good example of working together with the government. Now, there are technical definitions of PPP. I think uh, you will know much more about that than you know, I, would, I ever will, Amit. Uh, but I, I really calling it working together with the government. And uh, it was intriguing to me to really look at uh, what kind of an experience and how did it come about. And uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a vibrant institution today, considered to be uh, certainly among the best institutions, universities in the Northeast, uh, perhaps one of the best institutions or universities in the northern part of India. And in a very short period of time, it's uh, started with the base of engineering and medicine as the core foundation. Today, it's expanded from there into, be, into becoming a truly multidisciplinary university. It is not yet, in my view, a true university uh, because uh, we haven't yet uh, given enough weightage to liberal arts and humanities, which is one of the big weaknesses of, uh, in, in many private universities here in India. But it's getting there. We're putting in more and more effort, and it's getting there. Now, when I went and looked at our experiences, uh, a few things stood out. One, the nature of the engagement with Sikkim government was based on the fact that the Sikkim government was more than willing to uh, go more than uh, was willing to go more than halfway in ensuring the success of the institution. So, number one, the real benefit in succeeding or making sure that SMU was a success was clearly understood by the government from day one. I'm going to connect this up with some inferences that I will draw up a little later. This is actually a very key point that I'm starting off with. That's number one. <laughs> number two, uh, we had a, a very strong sense of uh, uh, continuity, starting with the first set of people in the bureaucracy there who were really involved in uh, Mr. Sridhar Rao, who was the principal secretary there, you know, later continued to be an advisor. And the continuity that existed from the bureaucracy was actually quite uh, uh, exceptional. And all of them were committed. The viewpoints may have been marginally different in terms of the strategies one needed to adopt at any point in time, which is how it should be. But the core commitment to making sure that SMU would be a success, and the core recognition that Manipal is in place to make sure that SMU is a success, both, I think, were uh, fairly distinguishing features. So for, I mean, therefore, the inference from that, of course, is that continuity has got to be a, a key component going forward which is often a problem with the government because the bureaucrat who really starts it off, who's got the commitment, you know, in a one blink can get moved away and moved into a completely nothing to do with education, maybe, you know, running highways or, or ports or something, you know, and it's, it, that is a big issue. That's a huge issue, actually. And in fact, uh, one of the suggestions that I have continuously given to the government is that this entire concept of a PPP under each ministry, I've been saying that you must, uh, uh, you must uh, move it out of the bureaucrat handling into almost like a corporation where there's a secondment for a fixed period of time, that's more likely to have uh, a better chance of success. So the PPP has come under that. It's almost like a uh, so like an authority that you create, the PPP authority under each ministry. So that probably is one way that can be. But the continuity was there right through. Third, we also uh, asked for in the beginning and received uh, the acceptance from the government that at our request, um, we would be able to ask for secondment of uh, uh, key people who would be uh, part of the management of the administration of the university. Uh, the previous, uh, um, uh, not the current vice chancellor, but two vice chancellors prior to that was actually a Sikkim Carter officer who was seconded to us as the vice chancellor for an extended period of time. And in fact, he uh, is now in DST. He actually oversaw the expansion of the university and actually the university going through some really trying times, uh, you know, where there were some challenges from uh, the Medical Council of India. So he really saw the, the transition through very, very, very trying times. And I, I, I believe that uh, uh, that sense of ownership in the sense of even participating in the administration is crucial to the success. And it was not a foisted upon, uh, you know, position. It was a requested by position. So that to me was another uh, key experience that came in. Today, Sikkim Manipal University has about uh, uh, 5,000 plus students in the campus there. has a vibrant distance education program. It's expanding into newer areas. Just uh, decided to build two more campuses. It currently has two campuses, one in Rangpo in the, in the, at the base and Gangtok as well. And it's now decided to build one more uh, fairly large campus. So the expansion is going on extremely well. We also had support from some parts of the government from donor, which is the Department of uh, 
uh, northeastern region. That, that's something that really supported us very well. Those are, you know, good things. But I think the fundamental plus that we really had was with the Sikkim government. I think it's been a, it's been a great experience and continues to be a very good experience for us going forward. And I will draw, like I said, one or two conclusions from that, uh, from this in just a moment. Uh, the second experience that we had was uh, in Malaysia, when. Uh, when Manipal Group, which today has a substantial presence outside India, uh, our footprint outside India covers uh, Malaysia, Nepal, Dubai, Antigua and the Caribbean, um, and soon uh, Sri Lanka, and then perhaps other places as well. We actually did it not because of a grand strategy, which I can proudly say we drew up on a uh, hotel napkin, which we can frame and, and hang. It did not happen because of that. It happened because we could not grow in India. We were prevented from growing in India, and therefore, when there was, at that point, I wasn't there a part of the group at that time, but at that time, when there was a suggestion and an invitation from the government of Nepal, saying that, why don't you look at expanding in Nepal, uh, we kind of uh, said yes. Um, and uh, in fact, I should give you a third example of something that's not worked very well as well, so I will, I will talk about that in a minute. The, uh, then we, Malaysia, invitation came from Malaysia, which is where I went. Now, when we went to Malaysia, now, Malaysia had a policy at that point in time, continues to have, that uh, uh, one, it, it used to allow for-profit education, continues to allow. I won't get into the ideological battles because that will then hijack the entire session somewhere else. Uh, but uh, I will talk about the fact that the, uh, uh, the government was uh, more than willing to support it. So we have a medical college in a state called Malacca. Uh, Malacca is about two hours from uh, Kuala Lumpur. And the state government of Malacca was more than interested in supporting us because they felt that somebody like Manipal coming in to set up a medical school that would be set up to standards that uh, they would be happy, um, uh, they would be truly happy to have, uh, would be a fundamental change agent for Malacca as a state in many respects. And since then, it's been a fantastic experience. They hold 18% equity in, um, in our uh, medical school there. And right from that time, not only did they participate in the equity, which was, of course was not a uh, condition or anything that we had put in. They had made the request and we felt that uh, you know it would be good to have them on our board. They continue to have a representative on our board, very active one. In addition to that, what they really did was they went out of the way. A medical education cannot be completed without uh, clinical uh, slots being available through hospitals. Right. So one of the things that the Malacca government did was to really work with the federal government. Uh, Malaysia, somewhat like India, is a, is a federal state and federal setup, a little more federal than, a little more uh, central than uh, India as far as education is concerned. So they actually worked with Kuala Lumpur central government, Malaysian government uh, to amend uh, some uh, rules that existed at that point in time, uh, which would have prevented them from extending the use of uh, initially two hospitals and now four in the, in the Malacca state, that region. Uh, to be used as clinical uh, uh, clinical um, hospitals, uh, teaching hospitals for us. And that's a fundamental shift uh, that was done. Uh, the, the Malacca government also worked successfully with the, uh, with, the, uh, with the central government there to enable creation of a new approach towards, uh, uh, towards uh, education delivery and pedagogy uh, by allowing the first two and a half years of this program to be actually conducted in, in India. And therefore, the wrap up of assets could be done. So, clinical, right now, the basic sciences happen in India, and the clinical uh, rotations, the didactics as well as the clinical rotations on the clinical side actually happen in Malaysia. So, it's an interesting mix that was created. And I can say this with certainty since I have uh, you know, dealt with them extensively that this could not have happened but for the support from the Malacca government. In turn, uh, what, uh, you know, I've talked about all good things about the government, and what is it that they expected from us in turn? They expected only one thing. They expected, uh, expected us to deliver good quality. And when I say good quality, it's increasing good quality. I think that increasing is a key component. Uh, any uh, education to me is fundamentally is about continuous increase in quality that you deliver. So you set and then increase and you set and you get a little better and a little better and a little better and that's really the way you can go. And that was uh, you know, fundamentally a, um, a commitment that we had to make today. Uh, Malacca Manipal Medical College uh, is the only uh, medical college in Malaysia to have got a five-year extension, otherwise it's three, three years. And it's also a six-star institution in their star ranking, the only six-star institution there. So what are the inferences that we can draw out of these two? And I did mention that I will talk about uh, one example where things did not work out that well, which was the relationship that we had in Nepal. Uh, I don't have the time to cover that, and maybe at a later stage, if there are question and answer, and we get a little point, I, I will touch upon that. 
But these two successful examples, three or four inferences. I believe that working with the government works best when there is an opportunity that can be taken advantage of or it can be addressed. When there is a problem that has to be solved, and if the government is looking at a PPP as a mechanism to solve a problem, I suspect that the chance of that working are not very high. But when there is an opportunity, in the case of Sikkim, as in the case of Malacca, both were opportunities that existed and they really wanted somebody to work with, you know, and therefore you could take advantage of the opportunity. And I think then you start off with a clean slate. There are no baggages, uh, both on the institution as well as on perception. And therefore, you know, things tend to work a little better. That's number one. The second inference that I can draw out of uh, this relationship is I think transparency and consistency of transparency. It's not transparency at a point in time. It's transparency and consistency of transparency right through, particularly from the private party, especially since all the decision-making powers both in, in both these instances are entirely with us. From the appointment of the vice chancellor after going through the process, right through the responsibility of administering the institutions in both these instances, everything lies with us. And therefore, consistency of transparency from the private side, I think, is absolutely crucial. And that's where many times, especially when things are good, everything is hunky-dory. But things are not okay, that's when transparency, unfortunately, from the private party, uh, you know, takes a, you know, takes a toss. And that's something that one needs to keep in mind. The last one that I will stop with, I think it's equally critical, is there has to be continuity at the government side. And as I mentioned with the Sikkim, you know, uh, Manipal University's case, and same was the case in Malacca. There was a there was continuity that was available, and that continuity was uh, was across political dispensations, was across bureaucrats that existed, leadership bureaucratic leadership that existed in both places, and therefore that continuity made a huge difference. And in turn, we made sure that the nominees, you know, the two nominees in in Sikkim and the one nominee in Malacca on the board, were not only just kept informed, were actually made into active <coughs> members. So by demanding active participation we were able to, in some sense, ensure continuity, hopefully, over a period of time. So these are the, the quick experiences that I can um, so, so let me start by saying that it's been quite challenging to figure out the right pitch uh, for this particular conference, because I mean, normally the seminars I'm used to giving are extremely technical and academic in nature. And so it's very tempting to abstract away and do a big picture talk. But in some sense, following with, you know, in the spirit of Gita's talk, I think it is important for us to recognize that in most sectors, including education, there often isn't a simple black and white answer, right? I mean, and that it's really important to conduct careful empirical research. And so I'm going to take, you know, and take the liberty of asking you to indulge in what might seem extremely minute levels of details when it comes to understanding this issue of public-private partnerships and walk you through some of the research we've done in Andhra Pradesh over the past three or four years. Um, in fact, uh, the other thing I'd like to let you know is, you know, I still have 15 or 20 minutes today, but on Friday, um, uh, 15. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd ask Parth for that. Parth had promised me 30. Uh, but anyway. Uh, mm -hmm. But on Friday, I'm, I'm giving a public lecture at NCAR. Uh, that's a one and a half hour talk. Like, I mean, summarizing what we've learned from about 10 years of research and education. And for those of you interested in that, I'd strongly encourage you to come uh, because that's publicly available, accessible. Um, and, you know, it will showcase a bunch of papers. So let me quickly get through the main point of this paper. This joint work with Michael at Harvard and Menke at the World Bank. And it's a project implemented by the Azim Premji Foundation, who we represented here in the audience. Uh, so the background numbers are pretty well known to everybody, which is we have universal primary enrollment, but learning levels are abysmally low. Um, it's not simply an issue of increasing spending levels, because um, if anything, the spending trajectory has been upwards over the past 10 years, whereas the learning trajectories are absolutely flat. Huh? Now, one fundamental set of issues here is accountability. So this is work we had done back in 2003, uh, just measuring and finding that on any given day, about 25% of teachers in government schools are absent. Now, I could have presented, I was telling Parth, there were five different papers I could have presented here, and one of which is an All India panel study we've done going back to the same 1,500 villages we went in 2003, and we've gone and measured everything right there, and the headline number is after seven years of increasing spending of billions of rupees under SSA, that headline absence number has not changed, right? So that absence number continues to be 25%, okay? Um, and that's also true in our detailed work in Andhra Pradesh. So, and in some sense, you know, what we are seeing as, is, is a response to this, that you've got this explosion 
know, free charging private schools. I think, you know, uh, we've documented this in All India Work, but I think Jim Tooley did a much, much better job than us of kind of, you know, really fleshing out the story of what is going on, right? Like, I mean, with the beautiful book and the beautiful tree. Um, but, you know, I mean, this is stuff that those of us who've been doing research in the field have noticed for a long time and documented. Gita's done work on this, we've done work on this. Um, but, you know, I want to highlight something about primary sc private schools in India that is kind of particularly stunning, which is, if you look at the data from the Indian Human Development Survey, what has kind of generated an enormous amount of angst, I mean, at one level, because there is clearly social stratification in education in India, and at another level, it's because many of these private schools are, in fact, not that good, um, and so people just don't know how to deal with this. Um, and, you know, when I want to make friends in government, I mean, the most provocative way I ask them the question about the quality of government schools is what does it say about the quality of your product that you can't even give it away for free, right? Um, and because that's basically, that's basically what the public school is, right? Um, and not only can you not give it away for free, you're not even able to bribe people to take your product, right? Because, <laughs> because the midday meal, so everything that is considered an incentive is actually, you know, there's a, in fact, some simulations I, uh, Jishnu Das and I were talking about suggests very perversely that in fact spending more on midday meals can reduce the average quality of education because that's inducing kids to shift from private schools to poorer performing government schools. Right? So it's a very, very counterintuitive sense, but you know, it's there's some important background perspectives to keep in mind. Okay, so but that being said, you know, so but at the same time, let's not fool ourselves and think that private schools are a panacea. So if you look at the cross-sectional numbers, I mean, of course, it looks like, you know, private schools do much, much better. So these numbers are in standard deviations, which is how kind of economists of education do all analysis and test scores, because then everything is normalized. Um, so private schools are doing significantly better on all our tests. But at the same time, they have parents who are more educated. They have parents who are more affluent. They have parents who are spending more time, OK? So the fundamental question at the end of all of this becomes, okay, so there's a bunch of existing work that finds that private schools do much better than public schools, even after controlling for household variables. But the problem is you can never be sure that there aren't these aren't confounded by omitted variables. So just to give you a simple example, parents who choose to send their child to private schools are clearly parents who are more motivated about education, are parents who are probably monitoring their children a little bit more. So is the difference between in public and private schools, is it driven by parents and families, or is that driven Driven by schools, right? I mean, and that's kind of the fundamental question that we don't really have a good answer to. And it really is the cornerstone of our public education policy debate because if you go talk to government school teachers, that's the first thing they're going to say. They're going to say that the private schools essentially have the elite kids who can pay, whose parents are motivated, and we are left with the first generation learners of more disadvantaged communities. And so it's simply not fair to expect that we can deliver those same results, right? I mean, so in the end, there is something sensible to be said on both sides. And at that point, it becomes an empirical question, right? I mean, there's only so much that armchair theorizing will take you. And at some point, you need to go look at the data and design studies that let you get deeper into this. OK, so um, yeah, so theory and cross-sectional data is the biggest backdoor voucher program, right? Like, I mean, so let's go support this. And as usual, you know, we do these huge policy changes without the foggiest idea of what the impact of this is going to be, right? I mean, and so the aim, in some sense, of what we've done in AP is to structure and evaluate a school choice program Right, that would actually answer this question. So what we're doing here is presenting results from the first aggregate school choice experiment in India that resembles the key provisions in the RTE Act. The experiment was conducted across 180 villages in Andhra Pradesh. And you have randomly selected communities and students are provided with these vouchers slash scholarships to move to a private school of their choice, typically within the same village. Now, there's many technical aspects of this design, which I don't think I have the time to get into. But let me just highlight kind of what's a little special about this design, not just in the Indian context, but this is, you know, addressing my academic colleagues, right, I mean, but more in the global context, right? So if you look at the best practice research of how do you evaluate the impact of going to a, pri just going to a private school. So the standard procedure of studies of this sort in the US and other parts of the world is to say that you have a scholarship program, okay, that children from public schools apply to, but there's always oversubscription. So you have limited number of slots for the scholarship and you always have excess demand. And so to be fair, you usually use a lottery, right? So you use a lottery to decide who will get the scholarship or voucher to go to a private school. And then the entire idea is that by comparing the winners and losers of the lottery, that all you're doing is the only difference between these two groups is who gets to go to the private school, right? So you're holding the family characteristics constant, you're holding the baseline test scores constant. So the only difference over a period of time for these schools, for these kids, is going to be the school they go to, okay? 
Now it turns out that even this design is not quite right and the reason for that is that there are spillovers. So to give you a simple example, so, oops, am I doing something wrong? Yeah. Don't don't miss miss something on cell phone. Uh, it's not mine. No. It's not mine. Uh, I have no signal. Uh, okay, so you know what, I'm going to skip through this and this is maybe something I'll save for discussions with Geeta and Jim later. I mean, but the point is that what we've done here is done not just an individual level experiment, but done a community level experiment, right? It means so you have essentially the ability to quantify the spillovers. To give you a simple, so think about the simple picture, okay? So normally what would happen is group one is the group in the government school that does not apply for the scholarship. Group two applies but loses the lottery. Group three applies and wins the lottery and moves into the private school. And group four is the group that starts out in the private school to begin with. Okay? Now, you have three sets of questions. Now, one question is how does group three do relative to group two? Correct? Which is holding the family characteristics constant. What is the impact of winning the scholarship that lets you go to a private school? Okay? But you're also interested in the spillover effects, which is what happens to the kids who start out in group four? So is there some adverse impact on that group because they now have an influx of below average performing children who are coming in from these government schools, okay? And normally this is not something you can address with a simple research design because over time other things are also changing, okay? So the main idea of this design is that you have a two-stage experiment which then, this is not me, right? So this is annoying. Uh, Sorry, switch what off? Yeah. Oh, switch the mic on. Is there a mic? Ah. No, it's off. Oh. Sorry, must be the? <laughs> That's right. There's all, it's all the buzz that I'm creating. Yeah. Uh, but you know what? I, it, it, I realized, I mean, I tried to give this talk in half an hour yesterday, and this is really a 90-minute talk, right? So it's impossible to do this in that kind of... Yeah, I, no, I, I, I realized that, okay? So I'm going to, you know, I'm going to skip through all of this. I'm going to skip through all of this, okay, and just basically highlight some of the key features of the design of the program, which is that for the household, it's a completely voluntary program. You can always go back to the government school. There's no conditions whatsoever, and the scholarship covered schools, fees, uniforms, etc. And similarly for the school, for those of you who are proprietors over here, and I think Mr. Mankad was referring to something like this about why most of the schools are very happy about this, right? Because the fees we are offering are at the 90th percentile of the distribution of the private school fees, and so that is covering higher than marginal costs for most of the schools, okay? So school participation is also completely voluntary, and you have the same story that some of the super elite schools will choose not to participate, but the vast majority of the schools have no problem whatsoever in participating, okay? So in many ways, the study design looks exactly, ha, 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 okay, the study design looks exactly like what would happen if you were to try and scale up some of these RTE provisions, okay? So this is just giving you an example of the power of the randomized allocation design. See, so what you see here is that between the groups that got the scholarships and did not, there's basically no difference, okay? So that's all you need to know in this picture, that there's no difference in their baseline performance, no difference in household education, no difference in household assets. So the only difference is that they went to a private school, okay? So the entire point of a design like this is you isolate the private school effect, okay? So now I'm going to go through results both in terms of process and test scores, okay? And the main result in process, I'm going to skip through this, okay, is in, it does look like teachers in the private schools work harder, okay? So the average teacher spends about half an hour a day longer in school, but in fact, it's 45 minutes more of instructional time because an extra half an hour of teaching activity and extra 15 minutes of correcting homework. What the government school teacher does more is about 15 minutes more of supervising the midday meal and about another 10 minutes more per day of administrative work, okay? So you put that together, you're getting an extra 45 minutes of instructional or passive instructional time in the private schools. Um, this is where the differences get even more stark, okay, which is if you then, because that is conditional on being present, okay, but the real action comes from how high the absence rates are. So if you look at the bottom row on teacher level characteristics, the government school absence rate in our sample was about 27%, like I mean compared to about 8% mean for the private schools, okay. Um, so by every one of the process measures, it looks like the private schools are doing better. So this is based on surprise observations by our team, from, uh, team led by MSR here, and you'll see that on every measure, the teacher is more likely to be present, is more effective in maintaining control of the class, and in every measure of process, the private school looks better. 
Okay, this is now then verifying the same thing. What is nice in the data we've collected is this very detailed time use diary for teachers, for students, so you can verify and back check all of this stuff. And what you see is that the children are reporting basically the same thing. Now, there's one very important insight in this particular table, which I want to call your attention to. So the first four columns are showing the average difference between a public and private school. Okay, so this has nothing to do with our scholarship program. And what you'll notice is that you spend about 30 minutes extra in school and you spend about 26 minutes extra doing homework okay now if you go look at the other side the other side is then looking at applicants who are offered the scholarship versus applicants who don't and now you're seeing to what extent is their behavior changing up enough to catch up with the typical difference of public versus private schools and this is oh there's no there's no pointer here right there's, there's one very important point to highlight here which is look at columns uh, the second last column okay because that's the one that use the mouse sir. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, no, nah, it's because I'm on animation. I'm on, I'm on presentation mode now, so it's not... No, no, it's a mouse in there. Oh, oh, okay, TK, oh, perfect. Yeah, I don't see it here, okay. Yeah, so look at this guy, okay? So if you look at time spent in school, basically these scholarship children have completely caught up, okay? So they are also spending an extra 33 minutes a day in school. But if you look at homework, okay, so the typical private school kid does an extra 26 minutes a day of homework, but the scholarship kids are not yet doing any extra homework. Okay, and so this is very important because it highlights that home and cultural habits, like I mean, are much more difficult to change in the short run. Okay, so you can go to school longer, you have a longer school day, but you're not making any changes, at least in the two years that we've measured this, we're not seeing any change in extra time at home doing homework. Okay. Um, now, this is then looking at parental satisfaction, okay? So again, it's the same way of looking at this, which is this is the typical difference between a private and government school, and this is then the difference between our scholarship kids and the non-scholarship kids. So one thing you do see is that the parents are significantly more satisfied with the quality of their education. So the typical difference is 15%, and in our sample, that difference is 13%, okay? So the scholarship parents are happier, okay? but. They are also pretty perceptive. So the next set of tables is asking you, what do the parents rate their child's level of intelligence, discipline, interest in going to school, interest in learning, and interest in hygiene? And you see that they are not yet noticing any significant differences on anything except hygiene, okay? And we'll verify that by then looking at the child data, and this turns out to be exactly right. Because the one thing that is changing in a big way is that children in the private schools are much more likely to use the school <laughs> toilet. Okay, so this is again the parental perceptions are backed up by what we're seeing in the data when we measure by talking at the talking to the kids and measuring at the school level. But if you ask the parents about how do they rate the effectiveness of the teacher in improving these things, which is the bottom, there they say the answer is yes. Okay, so in all of these, you get a significant positive effect. Effect, okay, so the highlight and you're going to see this again in the results over here is that the parents seem to be remarkably perceptive Like I mean that they correctly say that there's no change in levels But they're also saying that there is a change in the trajectory And so what it highlights is that education is complicated stuff I mean you don't change outcomes overnight even by changing the schools in one or two years, okay, so let me go <coughs> Straight down to, yeah, and then now if you look at the children's views, I mean, one thing that's interesting is the kids are less likely to like going to school, okay? And it's not surprising because they're being made to do more homework. Like, I mean, it's more work. I mean, you know, coming back to, I think, what Mr. Modi was saying about our culture of effort, it's not fun, right? Like, I mean, so the parents are happier, but the kids don't seem to be happier. And, you know, but notice this thing about using the toilet. About using the <laughs> toilet, there is a 20 percentage point increase, like, I mean, in the scholarship kids. So this is something that the private school does seem to be inculcating. And and it's important to keep in mind that a lot of research now shows that as much as the cognitive gains, a lot of what matters in school is non-cognitive processes, right? Like, I mean, including discipline and hygiene, and it looks like the private school is doing better in that. There's a little aside here for the RTE activists who think that simply signing a law that says that there will be no corporal punishment means there will be no corporal punishment. Because 80% of our kids like you know, happily report having been beaten in school and about 56% have been beaten in the past week. And this is just business as usual. Okay? So that's, that's, just, that's just how the schools run. Okay? So now, like, I mean, so I've shown you all this stuff on process. Okay? And now comes kind of, I think, the big surprise. The big surprise is after all of this work for two years, they've taken the scholarships, they've gone to the private schools, the teachers are working harder there's more time on task but if you look at the aggregate impact on learning levels it's basically zero okay like I mean now there is one important there is one important caveat okay the important caveat is if you break this by subject what you're seeing is you're seeing positive effects in English okay but negative effects in Telugu 
okay? So if they're taking sub tests in three subjects, in English, Telugu, and Maths, this aggregate effect is basically zero, okay? In Telugu, it's negative and significant. Maths is negative and not significant. English is positive and significant, okay? But now, clearly a big part of what's going on is that there is also a change in the medium of instruction, right? Because a lot of these private schools are English medium schools. So one of the kind of main stories that's coming out of this is now if you break down the results by students who go to English medium schools, you see that the English scores are dramatically better. It's about 0.5 standard deviations, which is a huge number. Okay? Better than public schools. Better than their, counterpa their counterparts who did not win the lottery. Yeah. So that is the key, right? We are not talking about the average public versus average private. We're talking about identical children who one set of whom got a scholarship to go to the private school, correct? So that's the comparison. So, but having gone to an English medium private school after two years, they're doing significantly better in English, but they're doing significantly worse in Telugu, okay? And so you can see why, like, I mean, this is a part of a very politically complicated thing, right? I mean, so if you were to, in one sentence, summarize the attitudes of state-level political elites to education, they would say, oh, the state instruction should be constructed in local language, but my child should go to English medium, okay? Um, and so this is part of a much more complicated discourse on globalization, which I'll talk about, right? Because, and I'll talk about in the comments, and not here, so remind me to talk about that. They're very tricky issues. Okay, but the other interesting thing here, for those of, you know, sorry, sorry, Amit. Okay, like, you know, but there are some implications here for the language of instruction debate as well, right? I mean, which is you're seeing that switching to English medium for families that have only exposure to Telugu is also hurting outcomes in maths, okay? Like, I mean, now, some of this could just be, there's an adjustment process, okay? But at least in the short run, this is not a free lunch, okay? Now, you could argue that what I'm doing by taking a simple average of these three subjects is not correct because you want to take the market return weighted <laughs> average. So it might well be true that the labor market returns to English are substantially higher than the labor market returns to Telugu. So then if you wanted to assess the impact of this from a overall effectiveness perspective, you would need to weight these subjects by their corresponding market returns, in which case it might well be positive, okay? But here is the bigger surprise. The bigger surprise is if you look at students who go to Telugu medium private schools, there's basically no change, okay? So here, in some ways, this is the more important comparison, right? Because there's no change in language. There's no big change in how you're doing your instruction. This is fundamentally, like, I mean, similar instruction, but different management. And again, you're seeing that there's all these improvements in process, but no big improvement in test scores. And I must say, this is in fact consistent with a lot of the research from around the world, okay? There's many, many school choice studies that typically find that parents are happier, like, I mean, but test scores are not going on, okay? So I'm going to wrap up and just, you know, I'm going to cut this and I'll skip all of this. And let me just summarize and kind of end with the key discussion. So I think the, where we are at the two-year point, I mean, this is a five-year project, right? I mean, so this is roughly at kind of the two, uh, slightly into two years of the project, um, is that the process indicators are a lot better for the private schools. The parental satisfaction is also significantly higher, but there's no significant impact on average test scores, though there is important variation by subject, right? I mean, so you're seeing these increases in English, but kind of put, uh, deterioration in language. So when we interpret this, I think, you know, basically, this is, this is the point of careful research, is that, you know, people and advocates and policymakers are often looking for simple answers, like, you know, oh, public is better or private is better. And the answer is that it's much more nuanced than that, okay? So one, one implication of the result is that it is true. We've known this for a long time that parents and households are a much bigger factor, okay, in education levels than schools. Now, and this is the famous Coleman report that studied this in the US in the 1960s basically said this, that 80 to 90% of the variation in learning levels are accounted for by household factors, okay? But why do we as policymakers and researchers, why do we focus so much more on the school than the household? It's because the household is not in our control, right? Like, I mean, it's not something that we can manipulate. So, you know, if you think as a scientist versus thinking as an engineer, the role of the scientist is to study the world and tell you what's going on. The role of the engineer is to use that understanding to build a better mousetrap, right? So the scientist in me can tell you that 90% of this variation is because of the households, but the engineer in me can't do anything about the households, and so I still have to go back and focus on the schools, okay? So the first implication of this is that simply thinking here about private schools, it's not a panacea for bridging these big gaps, okay? That a very large part of these gaps are probably driven by the household. But at the same time, there are many reasons to think, okay, that the private schools are in fact doing something better. So now let's think about the mechanisms. It's my last bullet. Okay, so the mechanisms. So one key issue here that we're seeing in a lot of research now on tracking, okay, is that 
it could well be the case that remember there's a cross-sectional difference of 0.6 standard deviations, correct? So the level of instruction that's going on in the private school is catering to a student who's at a much higher level, it can mean then where these scholarship children are entering, correct? So that could be one mechanism for why you have improvements and processes that are not translating into improved outcomes for these kids. Now if you compare this to say charter schools in the US or something, where the charter school studies typically find bigger effects than the voucher experiments, and that's because the charter schools are fun fundamentally in low-income neighborhoods that are targeting this demographic and can therefore potentially pitch their material at a level that is more conducive to rapid learning of the disadvantaged kids, okay? And so this has big implications for the way we think about RTE, right? I mean, and there's a lot of research now that shows that behavior is difficult to change. So you didn't get any increase in homework time, okay? So you got this increase in school time, but maybe there isn't increase in homework because parents are not able to follow up or maybe the habits are not changing. And then there is an issue, of course, of adjustment issues. We've gone to a different school, so maybe once we follow this up for five years, the results will be different. But here's the most important thing to keep in mind, is that remember that the value of the scholarship is only about 40% of the per child spending in the public school system. Because like Ms. Mankar was saying, the average right now is maybe two or 300, and it is 800 in the government school. It will eventually go up. But the scholarship amount right now is set to be equal to the 90th percentile of the distribution of private school fees. So another way of turning this around is to say, hey, the private school was able to achieve the same results with 60% less funding, okay? Um, and so all these process improvements that we saw are a reflection of better management practices but the true test would be, like, I mean, if a private entrepreneur could run a school at the same per child spending of the government system and run it as effectively as possible, and that would be then the more relevant long-term comparison for the relative effectiveness of public and private schools, okay? So, and let me be a good researcher and say, you know, we've done a lot of work, but we need more research, so. <laughs> I'd like to start with um, a little bit more for shock value. I actually heard about, I read about it in a newspaper article many, many years ago, and it sort of stuck with me, even though I don't remember the writer, is that India has first world aspirations, third world resources, and nether world sense of priorities. And in a sense, as far as teacher training, teacher education, everybody knows why our schools are the way they are. And it is about teacher training and teacher education and the quality of teachers and teaching. Uh, we just don't seem to know what to do about it. Uh, or we just don't do it. We seem to know, we know what we have to do, but we don't do it. So that's why my, um, I wanted to just title my presentation, Diets in the Doldrums, because my, I was asked to specifically talk about uh, uh, the, uh, making a case for privatizing diets, the district institutes of uh, uh, educational training. So I, I want to do a little bit of research on what, where, where are the diets currently, because we've done some work with diets and diet faculty, as well as d students in Karnataka, and that's where all my experience working with diets comes from. So I found that uh, the, the whole vision of diets was, uh, the vision of a diet was to restructure and reorganize the elementary teacher education to make it more responsive and to uh, realize universalization of elementary education. And that was based on a recent research two years ago by NCRT where they were doing a review of the diets. Uh, but what's the current status? The current status at a glance, there are altogether 599 districts in our country, 571 diets were approved in the 90s, the early 90s, and 529 functioning diets exist currently. Uh, there were supposed to be seven branches of functions as far as diets are concerned, but only three, uh, three or four actually function. Three aspects of the diet functioning actually work. Pre-service and in-service uh, training, field interaction curric and curriculum and uh, material development. They haven't really taken into account educational technology, planning and management, as well as uh, um, work experience. Link, the linkages between diets and SCRT and SSA are very tenuous, very limited, uh, often conflicting. The diet faculty salaries, faculty are not really accorded very much of state, uh, very much status because their salaries are the salaries of high high school teachers, so they don't really, uh, you know, command much authority or respect. Conventional teaching methods and evaluation methods are, follow, uh, you know, are followed in pre-service uh, DA ed education. As we all know, uh, they continue to follow, despite the fact that uh, NCF 2005, as well as NCTE's curricular <coughs> framework for teacher education, recommend uh, d uh, very clear uh, you know, improvements in diet 
curriculum. In service training, not using any innovative practices, so frankly, the teachers who are already trained and are supposed to undergo in-service uh, training under diets don't really find it, it useful. It's just a waste of time. The average tenure of principals of diet colleges, diet uh, institutes, is two years or less. So there really isn't very much time for the principal to do anything significant in uh, a diet. The campus maintenance, not satisfactory. There are very clear rules on uh, how much land, what are the facilities, libraries, playgrounds, classrooms, etc., uh, toilets. Much of the uh, maintenance is very, very poor and, and inadequate. That's based on the NCRT's uh, you know, recent review. But more than that, we've also found that there's uh, there's huge amount of duplication of training by diets and SSA, partly because they don't really uh, net, uh, discuss and uh, exchange or share. There's a huge amount of wastage of time, money, and resources, whether it's training uh, mandated by SSA or whether it's training mandated by the department. Uh, long delays in receiving funding from, from the center in most states, so that causes, that results in far, uh, far more inefficiencies in the institutes. Diet faculty appointed from senior high school faculty almost at the retirement stage, so you can imagine their level of enthusiasm or level of interest in doing anything for improving uh, the uh, you know, pre-service education. Diet faculty are certainly not, if you're close to retirement, you're, you don't really want to change the way you work, change the way you teach or train. And there are no rewards, and I think uh, it's been mentioned by previous speakers. Uh, I know Dr. Geeta Kingdon referred to it. There are no rewards for encouraging good performance and certainly no sanctions for uh, discouraging or penalizing poor performance or non-performance. Development of modules and courses for tra te teacher training, uh, especially in service teacher training, is very ad hoc with really no, no clear plan. Uh, and little or no professional development of the faculty themselves. <coughs> and of course, most of them are involved most, more, mainly with administrative work rather than teacher training or inspection work, inspection of schools, etc. <laughs> to sum up, curriculum is outdated. Teacher education institutes work under multiple authorities and conflicting demands. So does it have to be so dismal? Especially when we're talking about training teachers or uh, either in service or pre-service uh, pre or in service, training teachers who are supposed to w work with children with energy and enthusiasm and commitment and so on. Why does teacher education have to be so dismal and gray and outdated? Um, it doesn't have to be. It is possible to engage faculty like these. These are from diet faculty in Gulbarga district in Karnataka. It is possible to engage them. And I want to share with you one, one story. It's an anecdote. It's not research. It's an anecdote per, from uh, something that happened to me personally, because I was asked from by this diet in Gulbarga to uh, conduct a demo class. They said, OK, your, your trainers and facilitators are working uh, with our faculty. But I don't, we don't know how to teach this particular topic. Uh, can you come and uh, do it with our DA students? And this, the topic is in the prescribed English, English curriculum was something called synectic model of writing. Now, most of us would not know what it is. Frankly, even I didn't know. But I had to take up the challenge because the, Id the idea was that I had to engage with the diet faculty and the diet principal. So I looked it up. I researched on the net. And of it, it, it just, it put it simply, it's basically a technique for brainstorming for ideas to do creative writing. As simple as that. So those poor diet faculty, frankly, didn't understand it. But it's there in the textbooks. All various points are given. And the way they would have taught it would have been in a very, very mechanical, pedantic way, just sort of explaining it. And the, uh, the students, the DA students, would have memorized it and passed an exam, perhaps, but really wouldn't have had the foggiest idea. So what we did was that we, uh, we broke the whole exercise. We used, uh, we used technology. We used PowerPoint slides. We used group work. I, I used group work. There were 50 DA, second year DA students. And I had 15 other diet faculties sitting in on the class also. And uh, we, uh, I said there are only two two rules. One is that I think your English would be better than my Canada, so I will speak only English. The other rule is that there are no wrong answers, and so I so I said, can we all speak in English? They were more than happy to do that. We got them to work in groups, and they worked in groups, and they, they brainstormed ideas using the synectic model steps, which I didn't call them call it synectic model, but I just I gave them steps. 
and then at the end of it every group of five students or so actually wrote collaboratively a piece of writing by through brainstorming and actually read it out for the rest of the class at the end of it i said thank you to the t students and as they were walking out as they, as they were streaming out many of them came up and asked me do you think we can use this with grade one children now for me that was that was a, that was a, a, a small success the fact that they'd already experienced something and they could say that yes it's something i can do with my learners and so quickly in the in the course of just about 45 minutes after the students left i asked the diet faculty what did they what do you, uh, so what do you think about it there was sort of a few uh, several seconds of silence and then they said one of them said you know the students were very very interactive i said yes so what do you think uh, but it takes a long time you have to plan and prepare a lot <laughs> so i said yes you have to but then one a positive gentleman he raised his hand said but you have to do it only once after that you've got it uh, right i said yes the more you plan the you, it, it becomes easier as you do it then another lady said but you know these children these students are very difficult they want every word explained in kannada and i was shocked at that because there wasn't a word of kannada i'd used so i said why do you say that no they do they didn't i, I did i use any kannada they said no you didn't but with us they expect us to do now what's the lesson from all this so what's the point of the story I think we in our teacher education colleges and institutes we teach for incomprehension it sort of continues and uh, so whether children or teacher trainees or teachers we are teaching for incomprehension and that is something we have to stop if we are looking at teacher education looking is uh, relooking at teacher education and as somebody else has mentioned uh, has mentioned early in the morning we teach the way we are taught or trained so if those da students have been trained like that then that is the only way they will know how to teach with with students and yet in one short class they got an experience of teaching in a different way which they were willing to consider trying out in their classroom and they were wondering whether little ch younger children would be able to work in groups and so on so for me that uh, that uh, that was an uh, that was uh, a window to understanding that pre school uh, pre service uh, students pre service teacher education students are far more are quick to accept an idea and uh, and run with it rather than perhaps than in service okay the problem is looming large yeah the problem is looming large a short there's a huge shortage of teachers 1 to 3 million teachers across india we have contacted the teacher teacher foundations contacted some universities they do agree with it but they they nobody is doing anything about it nobody is doing anything about looking at how we gearing up for this huge shortage of teachers that's why our netherworld sense of priorities poorly qualified teachers with very suboptimal skills everybody every research nationally or internationally says the teacher is the critical factor for improving quality of learning and yet we aren't doing anything concerted about it i'd like to share, uh, share with you some ideas from other countries two countries two countries we are sort of familiar with uk and the us in the uk there are several routes to teacher education it's not just one route or two routes or three routes which is essentially what we have in our country you either do a dead after 12 years of schooling or you do a bed after your graduation or you can uh, do a distance uh, uh, bed while you're teaching in a school through ignu or any other distance university but in the uk there are several avenues for becoming a teacher which means that you don't have to preclude somebody who's older who wants to make a career shift and wants to teach but wants to do it faster so we uh, so this pgc after uh, you know after your graduation if you uh, and that's a full fledged one year program there's the graduate teacher program there's the school centered initial teacher training where you do not have to uh, you should have, you may have undergone just two years of university and not become a graduate but you can work through a whole year and get a qualified teacher status so the question is that we need to be able to give qualified teacher status more easily not bind it down the way we uh, we currently do without but enhancing the quality and making it more authentic and relevant to our needs and times 
there's a register I won't go into the details of all the but there are about 10 ways in which at least you can become a teacher and you don't have to be a teacher only for instance if you're a very experienced teacher like a lot of uh, RTE will require every teacher to be uh, B ed qualified or D ed qualified but there could be a lot of teachers who've taught for 15 years but and don't see the need and they feel they're good teachers in such a case in 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 a country like Britain they do have an opportunity to get uh, a, a qualified teacher status short in in a short span of six months without necessarily having to attend classes uh, for instance the registered teacher program um, it requires them uh, to put together a portfolio and through the portfolio they are being able to they are able to assess the uh, ability and competence of the teacher in the USA, uh, the National Center for Education Information estimates uh, each year about 35 individuals, 35,000 individuals entering teaching through alternative teacher certification routes. Okay, alternate teacher certification has evolved as a respectable concept, not as a fly-by-night operation, but more that it is it is it is one way in which you can become a qualified teacher and therefore become, do a good job of teaching. Uh, there are 122 alternative routes to teacher certification provided by, offered by 619 providers of individual programs across the US. Can we do that? And 70% of people opting for alternative routes to teacher education, teacher training are above 30 years. 38% are male and 30% are non-white. Being able to teach while getting certified and receiving a teacher's salary are benefits and that's something we should perhaps look at as stipends as uh, honorariums and so on so good alternative teacher certification programs are market driven and that comes to why i'm saying and i've got two minutes more um, recently, um, in, in the Hindu, uh, Dr. Krishna Kumar had said that the success of any measure, inclu which is RTE, he was uh, talking about RTE, depends on teachers. And that is where the system is facing its worst obstacle. Who will train that many teachers? One might have imagined that universities will play a major role in this national enterprise, but there is no sign of such an initiative being taken. And that is where we need private pe uh, partners. We need people like for myself, I would say with a selfish interest, I would love to partner with diets, with the governments in order to be able to revamp, re-energize, just uh, re-look at uh, teacher education, pre-service and in-service in our country, at least in the state that I come from, Karnataka. <coughs> Um, Dr. Levy, uh, Arthur Levine from the Teachers College, Columbia University said there's little research into what kind of training is most likely to produce a successful teacher. Dr. Geetha Kingdom mentioned that also early in the morning. Social scientists are now working to remedy through long-term study. So the fundamental point is that we need to think, we need, uh, we need to, we need, um, the po point is that we need people to think outside the box to shake things up a bit as uh, the, the State Education Commissioner stated, mentioned in the New York Times recently. Yeah. So I, I will reserve any questions to, I, I would have had, I would have liked to have said something more, but I put a thank you slide before that so that I knew I had a break. <laughs> okay, thank you.